the third plenary talk, uh, the final uh, talk of this plenary session, uh, entitled Analog CMOS from 5 micrometer to 5 nanometer by Willy Sansen. Professor Sansen has been full professor of the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium from 1984 to 2008. He has headed the ESET MICAS laboratory on analog design, which has created six spin offs in the last 15 years. Professor Sansen received a PhD degree from UC Berkeley in 1972. He has been the supervisor of 64 PhD theses and has authored and co authored more than 650 publications and 15 books, among which the PowerPoint slide based book, Analog Design Essentials from Springer 2006. He is a member of several editorial and program committees of journals and conferences. He was program chair of this ISSCC 2002 and president of IEEE Solid Asset Circuit Society in 2008 to 2009. He is a recipient of the DU Patterson Award of the IEEE Solid Asset Circuit in 2011 and he is a life fellow of the IEEE. Please welcome Professor Sansen. Thank you for the nice introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, analog design has been my hobby and my life for a long time. And I thank the ISCC for this opportunity to talk about it. It's an ambitious title because we go from five micrometer, I do remember, towards five nanometer, I don't know yet. So the question is, where do we come from and where do we go? This is explained by this well-known law you all know. Five micron is more than 40 years ago, using technologies which we don't know anymore today. And the five nanometer is expected only in 2020, but next year we do expect 10 nanometer, 2016. Because when we look at this conference, for example, we see that we don't have any 10 nanometer. We had last year on the ISSC 2014, we had already four papers with 16 nanometer channel length. And this year, if I counted well, we have an, again four papers with 14, 15, 16 nanometer. So 10 nanometer is for next year. You also see from this, just showing you the number of papers versus channel length, analog is always a bit behind. So going from 5 micron to 5 nanometer, one of the questions is, why is that? What can you do about it? And are we going to do as well as digital towards 5 nanometer? Well, we started a long time ago, a very short timeline. We started a very long time ago with bipolar technologies, 10 micron bipolar. I do remember I made one of those when I was working at UC Berkeley, yes. 10 micron bipolar. Operational amplifiers, just one example here. An operational amplifier was the way to do and to go to a conference like this. But very soon after this, we all learned about switch cap filters and doing actually endless operational amplifiers. Switches and capacitances, still used today. Then later on, using them in a different way, using those filters in oversampling systems like Sigma Delta, Sigma Delta was mentioned already today. One of the pioneers of Sigma Delta got a Pedersen Award. So Sigma Delta is a very different way of doing analog. There's more single processing involved. Using technologies now, 3 micron CMOS, and we continue. How about 0.7 micron CMOS allowing RF, doing analog RF using a spiral inductor, for example, this spiral inductor here, which you can hardly see, I can assure you, it works like an inductor, but it works as well as a resistor, so you can do a lot better, huh? 
A better one is this one using bonding wires, but bonding wires is part of packaging, not really part of our analog list of components. So maybe this didn't get through because of this, but it's a very much better inductor than the other one. So spiral inductors set the, set the scene for RF design. And after that, a big change. Time processing. I will mention time processing, processing of analog signals versus time, many more times today where you go to time to digital converters rather than A to D converters or supplementing A to D converters. So this is again on a higher level than just transistor level, trying to go to what analog has been about for such a long time, to go to higher speeds and lower noise for the same power. So my very last one is finally we have reached terahertz I believe there was a paper on the last ISCCC mentioning a 0.5 terahertz VCO. It was a higher harmonic, of course, using a more advanced technology like 40 nanometer, a long way from 5 nanometer, but still getting to the terahertz level. Uh, and this is the beginning of millimeter CMOS. So this is just a very short timeline to explain what we are now. What I didn't show is things we seem to have forgotten we do forget things, coming on a conference, never making it to real products, things like switched current rather than switch cap. How about log domain? Didn't I see that before today? Log domain, what happened to log domain? What happened to what? something we did before too? Analog cat, are we using analog cat today to generate analog functions and blocks in a very short time? All question marks topics for future panels and conferences. Applications, very simple. I do mention only two. The Internet of Things, of course, the big buzzword today. You can't open a journal without reading about Internet of Things, invading in all applications we know. Automotive is certainly an important one, but the other ones as well. five G, six G, and those things are even more important when I show you the next application. I'm a strong believer of a phone close to my heart, which does everything I needed to do, like communication with other people, watching movies, paying my bills. So that's going to be true with the size that fits in my pocket, I hope, at some point. So in terms of applications, I don't think I have to convince you that there are major applications where analog will have to be used. And when I look at one of those, like for example, simply making a phone call, which you're not allowed to do in here. Huh? When you make a phone call, you will see that indeed, you will see that indeed, <clears throat> most of the power goes in the RF part because it's so difficult, as has been shown before, to transfer information on whatever frequency from place A to place B. So when we talk about RF, of which analog is an important part, we have to try to reduce the power consumption. Again, for the same speed and certain signal to noise ratios. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Hmm? So what that means for analog, well, a long time ago, analog was just separate chips. Nowadays, forget it. It's all digital, and we have to appreciate that. That means that we have to do analog design in the mainstream digital technology don't ask for additional components like resistors or coils maybe, inductors. So that means that's a big change for analog. Also, in addition to that, much higher frequencies are given. I just learned that DRAMs are too big. Well, actually, the frequencies offered to us in those small channel lengths are too high too. So the question is, how do you do all the conventional communication stuff except for the real high frequency LNA and mixer and all that? How do you do the low frequency stuff in a high frequency technology? Somewhere there is a excess of frequency capability. How can we turn that into a reduction of the power consumption of those analog blocks? Speed, the first thing I have to say about speed is, well, FT is a parameter that represents speed. And I've taken the simplest possible curve vertically speed horizontal channel length, 10 nanometer is on there, and you see a 10 nanometer on the left axis, we are going to reach a terahertz. 
the thing most people do remember is a 100-100 spot, 100 gigahertz at 100 nanometer, and from there on it's just about linear. We don't need, we don't need gigahertz for most of the filters and we need to deconvert us today, meaning that if we use, for example, 40 nanometer, that excess of frequency, can't we use that to save power? And the answer is very simple. It's going to push you, all your transistors, deep in weak inversion. So the very first thing I have to explain to you is how deep in weak inversion do you think your circuits in five nanometer are going to be? I think all analog designers will end up in weak inversion because of the excess capability of frequency. So let me explain for one transistor. All analog design starts with one transistor. So let me explain for one transistor first how deep you can go in one particular technology in terms of power consumption or figures of merit like including noise and speed. And for that we need a parameter that simply says how deep you can go in weak inversion. So on a horizontal axis, and I'm sorry for this slide, it's my most complicated slide. And I have some equations, sorry. So on the horizontal axis, we see that there's this current, but this normalized current, and the normalized current is simply called, called inversion coefficient, is shortened to IC, which personally I find a difficult name. Everything is an IC. So inversion coefficient is also an IC. It's inversion coefficient, once you get below one, you're in weak inversion, very low currents, exponential devices like bipolar before. If you have an IC larger than one, you are in the regions used most of the time now. And vertically on this axis, we are going to put a figure of merit. We need two parameters for that, all normalized parameters like channel length. The channel length parameter is simply for length, it's lambda. It's L scaled to a value which is technology, which is technology independent, just physics dependent. It's 20 nanometer. I can explain some other time where the 20 nanometer is coming from if you like. Huh? So we have a normalized channel length and the channel length gives you speed. And speed is called the specific speed. This is actually part of the VSIM 6 model, derived by Christian Enns and other people. So I simply take the same parameters. And I'm going to use them to do what? To figure out what can you squeeze out of one transistor? How are you going to bias your transistor right? What VGS minus VT are you going to use? What current are you going to use? That's what I'm addressing on this particular slide. So we have a figure of merit for one transistor. Speed, this is related to noise and the power consumption. It's a simple figure of merit. We can derive many more complicated ones from there. And if you look at that for a very conventional technology, like 65 nanometer, choices in terms of optimum power consumptions are obvious. There is a big flat region in the middle, no problem. And I can add some numbers on there to make it more exciting if you like. But if I go to, for example, 20 nanometer, there is a peak in there. People using 20 nanometer analog Thin fats, for example, I'll come to that. 20 nanometer analog, better work on top of that. And what is the value you have to remember from this? It's not a difficult value. The value you have to remember is one. I'm sure you can all cope with this. Meaning that indeed, when you talk about 20 nanometer around a bit higher, like 32 and a bit lower, the value of the inversion coefficient for optimum performance per transistor is one exactly between strong and weak inversion. And if I do that again for five nanometer, because that's in my title, isn't it? Five nanometer. When I talk about five nanometer, I see that, that we still have a peak value. There is an optimum, and we will have to use that for optimum performance. But the value is no more one. It's one over the square of that particular parameter. And for five nanometer, it's about 0.6, deep into weak inversion. If you do design with this, you are much closer to optimum performance. I will talk about optimum performance all the time. How much power you need for speed and signal to noise and distortion ratios. So this is the first point for one transistor, optimum biasing point. And if you do that for a two-stage amplifier, 
Some people do like two-stage amplifiers. Some people do like three-stage amplifiers. Yes, there are four-stage amplifiers. How about five? For just two-stage amplifiers, you see that indeed for a technology like eight nanometer, or shall we take 16? We have four papers, 16 nanometer. You see that indeed for speeds like a giga, a gigahertz, which is used in signal delta modulators, all values for a gigahertz, we are at one tenth of the limiting value between strong and weak inverted. So all analog electronics will end up in the weak inversion region of most devices. So we better learn about that. Now, that's for one transistor. Let's take two transistors. All things we don't like, we have to get rid of. That's why I put in a section here saying that, how about canceling capacitance? We don't like capacitance. How about canceling resistance? Resistance is power consumption. We should do something about it. How about canceling poles? Cutting frequencies at high, cutting gain at high frequencies by means of zeros. Who likes noise? Noise cancellation and distortion cancellation. Why do I do that? Just to figure out which of those techniques are going to emerge when I go to five nanometer CMOS. And uh, so let me have a very short overview of what exactly I mean when I try to cancel all those things to be avoided. The very first one is capacitance cancellation. Is that new? No. Paper in the ISSC later on in the journal in 1969, ladies and gentlemen, I'm showing you a circuit of 1969. It's in MO MI4, it has been done in MOS. I've added a little circuit on the right to convince you it, it has been done so many times. And why doesn't it work so well? I get contacted all the time to ask me why doesn't it work? And the answer is you always forget one of those parameters. People think that you can cancel the capacitance of a transistor by adding positive feedback from one end to the other in a two-stage differential, in a two-transistor differential pair, generating a negative capacitance to cancel a positive capacitance. Well, if you do that, don't forget there are six variables involved. The other transistor capacitances and the transconductance and the source and the load resistor. Somehow, you always forget one of those. I think we need to use more of this. And people keep on trying, but I keep repeating the same question. How much have you won by adding the capacitance? And I never get an answer. Because, for example, in here, you have to include the source resistance. Otherwise, if you get about this, to cancel that. So this we have to keep on doing, that's for sure. And this is being done on the highest speed circuit blocks, like, for example, a trans impedance amplifier for optical receivers many gigahertzes, okay, you see that indeed positive feedback with a capacitance is going to cancel this capacitance, which is your diode, optical diode capacitance, and that extends the frequencies to much higher values. That's number one. The second one is more common, especially today. There has been several articles in the most recent Solid State Circus magazine on negative resistances, and I'm glad, I'm glad, because this has been going on a long time too. All oscillators did that with tubes. I didn't start with tubes today because tubes didn't get published on this conference and in the Journal of Solid State Circuits, but they were earlier, of course. And here is such an oscillator. Cross-coupling, easier to see with transistors than with tubes, generates a negative resistor. And if the negative resistor is larger than the positive resistor, in the inductor, it's going to oscillate. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about amplifiers, how to get to lower currents for speed and noise. So that means that they have to have amplifiers using this. And this is a very nice example because it's a simple example. It's an amplifier. Most of you will recognize that. It's fairly symmetrical. That's what we like. Huh? You see that performance is only so-so. Performance is speed. The capacitance represents noise and current consumption. It's only 600. Maybe you have forgotten that one transistor in the same point gives you 1,500. 
I didn't dare to put that on my slide, 1500 for one transistor. Clearly this is less because you have more transistors. But if I do this, look at this. I do that myself. Huh? Don't look at the transistors. Don't look at the transistors. Look at the number on the right. It goes to 10,000. This circuit here is six times more efficient in power for noise and speed than a single transistor. We have beaten a single transistor. And that's what we have to do in analog design. You don't change the power consumption. It's just positive feedback around the current matter. So I'm sure this is a trick you all are going to use as soon as you leave this room. And this has been used in all the elementary circuits. You have noticed now we have two transistors, huh? On the left we have an amplifier, we have source force, we have cascodes, all circuits you know. And the only thing added in there are negative resistors to have larger transconductances, giving you larger frequencies. This has been going on for quite a while. This is a nice slide showing that this has been done already, look at this, in 1973. Okay, and has been done very routinely up to just last year at this conference. Putting in negative resistors is going to be used for simple blocks towards filters. For example, we all need filters. Where we do a comparison, this is CT, continuous time filter. Where we do a comparison, indeed, where we have a figure of merit, including everything, of course noise, which is embedded in the intermodulation free dynamic range. Noise and distortion, huh? Bandwidth is in there, and this power per pole. When you look at the best ones, when you look at the best ones, they all use negative resistors. Of course, there is a cloud in the middle here. I mean, a cloud of circuits, huh? Meaning that they all have similar performance when you look at them. That's why there are so many papers in the journal, huh? They all have similar performance, the ones with the negative resistors are on top. So do use that. The next is simply cancellation of poles and zeros. Poles you get automatically. Zeros you have to make yourself as a designer. So poles you get as soon as you have a capacitance and zeros you make. When I take an even more complicated circuit, this is a three-stage amplifier. Yes, you're counting right. One, two, three. And that's three-stage amplifier. Why three-stage amplifiers? Because if you play tricks around them, like, for example, a cascode generating a parameter which plays with another parameter, then you realize that actually you have second-order pole zero compensation. The A2 and the A1 are two times in there. And as a result, since you compensate for non-dominant poles, you'll have a higher performance. We get to 14,000 with this. This is 10 times better than one transistor. For people still looking at one transistor, this is what they should do. And this conference is very active in accepting papers along those lines. So I think there is a brilliant future for three-stage amplifiers because we had two years ago 18,000, last year 40,000, and just below 100,000. I think I would have made that 100,000, but I'm not allowed. So that means that indeed, we can easily reach performance levels way beyond to what one transistor can do. And this is part of the future of analog design. Now we get to the most difficult ones. Noise, you all know noise is generated as a power. It doesn't know a direction, so how can you cancel noise? And then distortion is even more hazy. Our first noise, I remember one of the early papers on this conference, not too long ago, where indeed you can cancel noise of one transistor, provided the noise takes two paths, one direct path and another path in this direction, and it's cancelled in the differential output. Of course, you have to be real careful not to generate other power sources, but it has been used, not only in continuous time in a very simple structure on the left, it can be done after demodulation in a receiver. So noise, once after demodulation, can be cancelled as well. It doesn't have to be done in the real time 
as it's shown on the left. So certainly there is an enormous interest to cancel noise. And we should have a conference or a panel or a course only on noise cancellation. It's worth looking at. Distortion is even more difficult. But you all know how to cope with it. The two most used circuits to cancel distortion, you all know. A differential pair and a current pair you have nonlinear devices, and both of them cancel distortion. This is very nonlinear, and this one as much, and you cancel it in the current gain. Same here, they're very nonlinear. And actually, when you look at all the distortion tricks, they are very, very similar. For example, in such a high frequency, low noise amplifier, you see that indeed the nonlinearity of this transistor is simply cancelled by the nonlinearity of a additional device somewhere in the circuit. This is never easy because the cancellation is very sharp, very hard to do, but you do gain always something. And there are some other tricks. I've taken this one here because you all know this circuit. A paper on the ISCCC of 68, 1968 where we had a Gilbert multiplier. But a Gilbert multiplier can be offset. Offset in the way that you have different currents and different transistor sizes or different VGS minus VTs. And there is a zero distortion point at the output. And this has been used in many filters as well. So distortion cancellation, as long as you can make devices with equal characteristics, all in weak inversion, for example, easily lead to low distortion circuitry. And this is a beautiful example. It combines two different tricks of the list. It shows that adding a negative resistor at the input of an operational amplifier, a negative resistor there. This belongs to this little square there. The negative resistor on the, at the input of an operational amplifier cancels nonlinearity. That's worth thinking about. So what we will see in the future in analog, when I look at all this, is combinations of all those tricks. And all of them will have to be used if you would like to do better in terms of power consumption for noise and distortion. If nothing works, if we are not succeeding in the cancellation of all this, what we have to do, we have to ask digital support. What for? The main culprit there is simply mismatch. I can't give you hope that mismatch is going to be better. I will show you mismatch for seven nanometer for 10 nanometer, not for five yet, it's not getting better. So that means what, whatever is related to mismatch like offset in ADCs and in RF circuits, we'll have to do digital correction. But there is more. There is a tendency towards that. That meaning direct analog to digital conversion. What does that mean? That means that we take a block in which a analog signal is converted to time or something else which is easier to measure. For example, time to digital converters in Sigma Delta ADCs and PLLs is one example, but there is more. So what we try to do is to go as soon as possible with our analog signal to something which is different in the time domain or in the digital domain. Usually it's the time domain. And time delay and time signal processing is in part of our design. One example in Sigma Delta ADCs one example in here only. Okay. One example, it's an early example where indeed, where is the analog circuit block in here? I'm sure you can find it because we see that this voltage indeed is going to change the supply voltage of a ring oscillator. Today, I call a ring oscillator an analog circuit block. I know it's used for verification of digital parameters but it's an analog circuit block. If we change the supply voltage, the frequency is going to change. And then if the frequency changes, we know how to measure time, various tricks with all digital processing to figure out exactly what the voltage was on the ring oscillator. This is done now in a A to D converter. But in my later examples, it's going to be done in simple amplifiers. So we go to time domain amplifiers, and this is part of our future. So this is one of the early examples, there are many more, all using ring oscillators in order to convert an analog signal into time. On the PLL's front, this is a digital PLL. 
sometimes I wonder why I talk about digital PLLs. Well, there is an analog block in there, okay? Meaning that indeed, where is the analog block? It's the same thing as before. You must have noticed this by now because there is a ring oscillator there again, which is synchronized by some other blocks. The ring oscillators are lousy in terms of noise. And the amplitude of the supply is coming from another analog block and from many more digital blocks involving both digital to time and time to digital converters. This is too complicated to go in much more detail. Simply saying that indeed we have to look at time analog semiprocessing as much as voltage semiprocessing today. So analog signals in the time domain, what examples do we have today? I will show you some examples with all different names like a ring oscillator based amplifier. Is that what we are going to make in the future at five nanometer? I think so. Or a switched mode amplifier. And there are some other names like a ring amplifier. First paper Wednesday afternoon in the A to D converter session, a ring amplifier. Is that the way to go for analog? I do think so. Just two examples. For example, here, same thing again. A, a ring oscillator where indeed the frequency after the phase detector is going to be used to close current sources. You should call them charge pumps, current sources, and giving you an output current. So we have an input current and we have an output current. So it's a current amplifier. Performance of this easily exceeds voltage amplifiers. Another example is this one. Converting your analog signal towards pulse width modulation. Routinely done in sigma delta modulators. The pulse width modulator is used to close current sources and to switch in voltages towards a voltage output. So switching amplifiers time domain amplifiers are going to be part of our future. And what you have been waiting for now, how about five nanometer? Well, to be honest, I didn't know. I had to ask experts like IMEC and some other people because five nanometer, they told me, is clearly a foggy thing meaning that you may not be able to read all this, but I can translate a few things for you. It's going to be part of the materials thing, like using germanium again. When I was a student, I had germanium transistors. And using other materials, gallium, arsenide, and other combinations, but also using different structures, no more two-dimensional, but three-dimensional, going indeed to dimensions which are quite low when you look on the right here. So I had to learn from there to see what is possible. And what are we needing? What, is, what are we asking from them, from those new technologies? I think we have four parameters that we would like to see. Of course, we like speed. Don't forget, the speed allowed us to go real deep and weak inversion, very low power. So that parameter comes back again. And the L square in there shows that it's very promising. Okay. So that parameter is still in there. What we need also is very steep IV characteristic. Which one? The IDS VGS characteristic. I've seen some kind of those characteristics in the previous talks already. That means that when you go weak inversion, you are in the weak inversion slope. You need a steep slope for a low supply voltage. So that means that you will have control on the gate all around the gate. Otherwise, you can never get this. And what we need is less mismatch. I repeat, this is hopeless. Sorry. And layout. We can learn all layout tricks. How we do layout. Are you going to stretch width and channel length? No, this is finished. We will have to use discrete devices. Shall I say, as before. If the current in one device is too small, you take a second one. If you need more, you take a third one or a fourth one. So that's how we're going to do design. You have characterization per transistor. And if you need more, you take more. So those are the things we are looking at. And here is the competition today. Not yet five nanometer, 10 nanometer. Next conference. The, left, the one on the left is a FinFET. Huh? FinFET saying that you have three dimensions here. Okay, whereas here it is more flat. Competition today for designers. Are you going to use FinFETs? Are you going to use a flat conventional transistor fully depleted on an isolated substrate, fully depleted SOI? This is more flat 
This is an extension of a conventional technology available today. This is three-dimensional, certainly a necessity for the future. Where is the crossover from left to right? Is that in 14 nanometer? Is that in 10 nanometer? Certainly it's going to be there. Surely at seven, it's going to be all FinFET oriented or even differently, phasing out flat or planar CMOS technologies. And when you look at some of those characteristics, they are very promising. This is one of ref noise. I didn't talk about one of ref noise. People who know me say that I always talk about noise, but that's not true. I didn't talk about one of ref noise, okay? Simply because it doesn't make any difference. What you gain in tin oxide, increasing your oxide capacitance, you lose by using smaller dimensions. And the noise density, average noise density, doesn't change all that much. I have been claiming for the last, let's keep it simple, 30 years, okay, that KF is technology independent. I can predict the one of ref noise of a 10 nanometer device. So this is not my part of my study. Variability S. There is a 10, 10 point. At 10 nanometer, you have 10 participants in the conduction. That's very few. If one doesn't make it, you have 10% variation in the current. The variability is a real problem. And this is a sketch. And when you look at real values, you see that indeed it's there. For conventional CMOS, where you learn that on this conference or on IEDM or other conferences, we have had for below 130 nanometer, we have something like 2.3, 2.5 millivolt micron as palindrome factor, and it has been constant since then. Do we get less by using those fancy technologies? Yes, we get about half. We get 1.3, we get 1.4, it's about half, and that's it. So it's going to be worse, but at this moment, experimental data simply gives you half. So that's where digital assistance will be required. Speed is not going to be what my simple expression has explained. Because if you look at, for example, on the GM or at the FT, we see that indeed, at the FT, we lose about one third. Having a tighter control on the channel of a MOS transistor means that you have more capacitance and more capacitance invariably is going to give you less FT. You lose about 30%. When you look at that good expression, you'd have to settle for 30% less. Shown in experimental data, like for example here on a recent IEDM conference two years ago, you see that indeed for smaller channelings, the FT doesn't go up that much. FinFETs give you less high speed than expected. Maybe we have to go to a technology we know so well, like CGA. This is bipolar again, because look at those values. I was talking about terahertz. This is half of it. And the rest, I could say, FT looks nice and so on and so on. But, but they get it at a much higher supply voltage. So people fed up by trying to get power out of a circuit, because you only get a one volt supply voltage. Now look at this. This is 1.6, 5.2. Power amplifiers benefit from this. Transmitters, better use a technology like this one because you have a higher supply voltage, even if the speed is not as much as what we expect at 10 nanometer. So when you put that all together, I've tried to put that all together on one slide. And I'm glad it's still very quiet here because many people don't agree with this. So this is maybe a slide for a panel somewhere, I don't know. Subthreshold slope, surely the FinFET gains its N is one, its subthreshold slope is minimum. The other ones don't have that. Gain that goes together with it. But it creates more series of resistance. It has become a little cylinder so narrow. There is a lot of resistance in there, making it worse than the more conventional fully depleted SOI, which is still planar. So for this, which you pay directly in terms of speed, there is a speed reduction in FinFET, which is hard to, hard to avoid, as long as you stick with 
tight control of the conductor, you have a speed reduction. Compatibility with CMOS, you don't have that with FinFET. It's three-dimensional. You do have that with fully depleted SOI. So today, the best way to continue along the path of more is to go to fully depleted SOI. But later, it may change again. So towards five nanometer, this is the future, not this, I believe. And in terms of supply voltage, just one line, those are very similar, but bipolar is clearly better. So this is actually something to be refined as an overview of below 10 nanometer. Now, below 7 nanometer, and we slowly get to the 5 nanometer, and then I can stop talking, huh? Below 7 nanometer, people say very foggy, only question marks. I will show you examples of gate all around transistors. How does that work? And vertical nanowires? Don't ask me about this, and don't ask me about quantum. I'm the wrong person. So let me show you one. There is a horizontal one, and I have a vertical one. The horizontal one takes space. That's why people prefer the vertical one, to have small space. The horizontal one, of course, very few devices, has been used in all of the recent papers here. You see the gate controlling the current in all those pipes, and those little pipes, sorry, in all those carbon nanotubes. Then are very small, look at the dimension, 1.2 nanometer. This is beyond five nanometer. The only problem is it takes a lot of area, but we can't have that. So maybe this is more the future, the vertical one. When you look at the vertical one, you see indeed the carbon nanotube again. You're welcome to call that a vertical fat or nanowire or whatever. You see the gate all around, controls the conduction in there. The dimension there is only something like eight nanometer, getting closer to the to the five nanometer. The subthreshold slope is close to 60 millivolt per decade. Of course, because of the tight, very tight connection here, we have lots of capacitances leading to the same reduction in speed indeed. And for example, this circuit, you all know so well, I'm sure, it's a digital circuit and an analog circuit has been made in those devices. You see clearly that this design needed four nanotubes and four over there. This is the input. This is the output. The gate, sorry, this is the input. And the output is over there. And this is the VDD and the supply. So this is already a circuit in those seven or eight nanometer vertical transistors. What do we learn from this? Well, Design is all about IDS, VGS, and IDS, VDS characteristics, at least in the beginning. So I show you two characteristics which you know so well, the exponential characteristic of weak inversion and the flattening off, and the IDS, VDS characteristic. All designers know how to play with this, but those belong to five nanometer of those vertical fets, meaning that actually design, analog design with those devices is not going to be very different from what you have been doing before. We have similar characteristics, and of course we need those people to figure out what kind of GMs to get and all those capacitances, that's modeling. But from the design point of view, it's going to be very similar. Leading to conclusions, what is design in five nanometer going to be? We will all be over there, ICs below one, that's clear. That's already going on today. Yes. Secondly, once you know how to do an analog circuit, you're still an expert in five nanometer. It's very similar. Design expertise is something you have and can use in the future. All the design tricks and the combinations are going to stay there, and you will have to use them. That's why I listed them all. Okay. Yeah. Go for that. Direct analog to digital conversion. Okay. Using switching amplifiers, ring amplifiers, VCO based this and VCO based that. Yes. Oops. And finally, you always learn something. And that's the basis of analog design. So why don't you keep on doing this? Learning is the basis of analog design. And learning is what leads to quality of life. Thank you.